Well, hello again. Uh, we're continuing along um, on our uh, cruise to Ephesus. We're through Ephesus. I forget the original title right now, but um, we did uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Now we're on Ephesians 2, 10. And if you have a title for the website or the blog, it's um, a good work to walk in. Uh, and thinking of that, do remember to go to my website and blog uh, or wherever you found me. If you found me on YouTube or Facebook, um, it's bishopbatescec.org. And there's a whole bunch of uh, reflections. Um, I, I thought of calling them uh, ref um, thoughts, reflections, and ramblings from an old man. Um, but they're, they're basically looking at scripture, looking at some theological issues and the uh, uh, some some events that might be happening in our culture and the church right now, and just my uh, thoughts, ramblings, and reflections. I suggested um, last time, um, and I've suggested elsewhere many times that Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine are critical verses about faith and grace and and the role of faith and grace in our salvation. I have a new Bible I bought. Um, I haven't started coloring in it yet, but I've been using it um, on my desk. It's uh, the, let me see, Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic Edition. And I got it because it has st great study notes, particularly on the Deuterocanonical books. Um, and it's heavy, so it must be holy. But let me read those that verse 2, 8, and 9, and then verse uh, 10, which we're going to deal with in this little reflection. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. And then verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, when we talk about being saved, uh, it's both, it's not only being saved from something, trespasses, darkness, sin, eternal separation from God, um, the devil, the world, but it's saved to something as well. It's saved to become a new creation and to have an eternal participation in the image and the likeness of Christ himself by the working of the Holy Spirit forming his image and his presence in us. So that's what Paul's suggesting here. When he says, we are God's workmanship, in other words, God created us. Uh, the, the Lord, uh, the creeds we say, he's our God our Father, the creator of. Well, he's the creator of us. And we're created in Christ Jesus, this new creation. We've been saved into this new creation for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the question always arises when somebody first hears this text is, what are the good works that I should walk in? Or how do I know God's plan for my life? Um, people go many times uh, come up to me and ask that question, and or have, or have asked me to pray and get a word from God about his plan for them. And then I usually respond, why would I, why would I do that? Why would God do that? Why would God tell me your plan? Um, and so I said, what I will do is teach you how to pray and listen to God so you can hear from him. Um, I have that same sense about people who are always getting in prayer lines to get a word um, now, I believe that God speaks prophetically, gives words of knowledge and wisdom, and, and certainly uh, when there's a prayer ministry uh, and you need prayer, go up and get it, and maybe the person praying for you will hear from God or something. But uh, I tell people, pray, and God will speak to you. Develop your prayer life. Develop your time with the Lord. And so ask your teacher how to pray, not your teacher, your pastor, uh, to teach you how to pray and more importantly, how to listen, how to hear God. And it's a process. Now notice in um, this text, again, something we've been talking about, but Paul says we and not you. So 
it, this is once again an issue of community, a we, a collective we, um, not, um, not I or, or my, although I believe God has something for you. But he's talking here to the whole church. Um, and so what are the good works that, that he's prepared for us, we together? Well, unity for one. We're going to say next week I'm going to talk about that, but uh, we've already read in, in, in Ephesians that his will is that all things be brought together in one, uh, particularly the issue between uh, the Jews, the people of the covenant, uh, the Hebrew uh, people, in unity with the Gentile people or the people who weren't in the covenant. And that they become one, that the church brings those together so that Paul's going to write, uh, in uh, the book of Galatians, there is neither uh, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female, but all are one in Christ. And he's going to go on in Ephesians that our unity is going to be found in Jesus. The second thing, what is the good works to walk in? Forgiveness. We've been given a ministry of reconciliation to forgive one another. That's a work of God. Mercy. We're to be a people of mercy, of graciousness, of hospitality, of restoration, uh, a, a people of peace. Uh, these are the good works, but the best work, the best work of all is to walk in love, to have that love of God formed in us so that we're loving unselfishly and sacrificially towards those around us to love uh, as um Jesus said in, in the Sermon on the Mount, to love our enemies, to get beyond loving our friends, beyond loving our family, although those are all good, but to move into the area of loving our enemies. Uh, now, I understand, <clears throat> or I think I understand, that uh, if you want to live a surrendered life in Christ and uh, being led by the Holy Spirit, you will desire, there will be part of you uh, individually that wants to know his plan, his purpose, and his will for your life. I've talked to, now I know to many of you who are even listening to this, that are, that are really saying, I wonder what God's will is for me. What, what does God want for me? What's his purpose for me? And um, getting down almost to, you know, am I supposed to marry this person? Am I supposed to have children? What kind of job am I supposed to have? And I understand that. I understand that desire because what you're saying is, I, I love God so much that I, I want to surrender to him. Now, I had this question I, at one point in my life when I presented myself for ordination to the priesthood, discerning what people call the call. Um, and I want you to know that that discernment or that, that thinking about that, when people say, how do you know you're called? It was not a one-time thing. It was a process over years. Although when I talk about it, I'm usually given two minutes. And so I have to condense this, this lifetime experience, even going back to when I was a little kid. Um, it did involve the supernatural at certain points. And a lot of it was discerned in prayer, you know, praying and uh, particularly learning to do the daily office and read the scriptures and which I've said to people, there's not a day when I, when I read the daily office that God doesn't speak to me in some way from those scriptures. Not always earth shattering, but something for me uh, to chew on. Um, so, but there was also in the process, and, and you need to hear this. So if you're looking for a supernatural kind of revelation, it might happen, but there's also a natural process. If I wanted to be ordained in the Episcopal Church, which I was a part, I needed to have a bachelor's degree from, from college. I needed to have a, get a master's of divinity. Uh, I had to go to a seminary, and that had to be approved by my bishop. Um, and I had to have a sponsoring congregation. In other words, uh, uh, for me, it was St. Thomas Church in Auburn. Um, and then, with, even with all of that, I needed the approval of, from the Commission on the Ministry of the Diocese. My diocese was Western Massachusetts, and the standing committee of my diocese. And finally, there had to be desire on the part of my bishop to ordain me. He had to say yes. I could say all I wanted, that I was called, but without those other things in place, I was not going to be an Episcopal priest. 
It was a process and, and was not, not without a struggle, many moments of struggle and difficulty and conversations with all of those involved. At times, it seemed to me, if I'm honest, uh, very political and institutional, and I struggled with that. And um, But if I look back and I see that the whole thing over, over like a four or five year period of the discerning process along with the church, it really was more spiritual. And it was a very powerful learning experience and and a process that formed, I hope, uh, what some call a priestly character in me. And, uh, and so the surrendered life uh, must be surrendered um, to someone. And if you're going into the priesthood as I did, it was a surrender to your bishop. It was a surrender to the standing committee, commission on the ministry, the parishes, the seminary, to, to that process. And of course, naturally, of being surrendered uh, to the Lord Jesus and in, uh, in a relationship with him. So I, I know th- that process, and oh, oh, one of the things that came out of it is that you know, to be a leader, you must at one time have been led. Uh, there's, there's, uh, we're called to be followers. For example, Jesus says, come follow me, to be a servant. And so you've got to live that out uh, in order to be a leader, which you never really obtain. One cannot be an authority or in authority over someone else unless they have been under authority. And let me suggest continue to be under authority, that there's someone you're accountable to. Um, and that, that's that got to be lived out and learned. And we can all say we're obedient and we're on authority until the authority says no or tells us uh, to do something that uh, we don't agree with. Uh, and there's a learning process right there. Now, I'm, I'm talking, obviously, about uh, the authority giving you godly wisdom or, you know, it's not to, to do something illegal or immoral or you would naturally have the right to resist that, you know. The people under Adolf Hitler said that they were just obeying orders. Well, that's ridiculous, you know, um, to orders to kill six million people. Uh, but if you were given orders, the people in the American army were given orders, and many men went off to die. Uh, there's great stories of the landing on D-Day when young men, their sergeant or their lieutenant would just say, charge. And they would go, they would obey the order and were killed. And their blood was shed to defeat the tyranny on the other side. Um, but of course, you see, when it comes to living in obedience or under authority in Christ, it's always got to be incarnational because there's the danger that we will make Jesus in our own image. And we will we will have Jesus agreeing with us all the time. And I've even had people come up to me in, in, um, who are like that, who have no accountability, and, and say, God has told me to get a divorce. Well, he didn't. <laughs> you know, it, or God told me I need to steal this. Well, he didn't. God won't go against his word. And so, uh, because we'll, we'll get that desire in us and, uh, and then justify it. But we need, we need, is, if you're going to go into uh, ministry, particularly if you're listening and you're thinking of going into the priesthood or the diaconate or some ordained ministry, um, you need to learn that incar- incarnational authority of being under someone, of being accountable. So after the process that I went through all those years, I could honestly say when somebody said to me, how do you know you were called to the priesthood? And I can respond, ask them. It is the bishop and his council that determined I was called. They were the yes and the amen. And I believe that not because I felt it, but because they believed it. And I could look back in the moment I knew I was called because a bishop laid his hands on my head and always going back to that moment. Now, moving forward on that, how do I know I'm called? How do I know the plan? Scripture comes 
in the, this Ephesian passage, it says, we are each created by God. You are God's creation. Your parents didn't create you. They participated in the creation. Uh, that's why they, we talk about uh, procreation, being part of. God is the creator. Man creates nothing. He just takes what all, already is. I mean, if you plant tomato seeds, you didn't create tomatoes. Uh, you didn't create the seed. Uh, you took part in the creation process. And so it is for each of us, our parents participated in the creation process of God. And uh, I think we all need to take a moment. And uh, if you were born after 1973, and thank God that your parents didn't choose to abort you, uh, that they didn't think they, they thought this is a gift, um, that you were a baby, you were a child. In all the years as a psychologist and uh um, and a priest, I've never had a woman come into uh, uh, my office and say, oh, I'm so excited, I'm carrying a bunch of cells. They would come in and say, I'm so excited, I'm pregnant with a baby, uh, a life. Now, Psalm 139, one of my favorite Psalms, verses 13 to 14, is, are, is one of the most pro-life statements in all of Scripture. You should really memorize this verse. Uh, says, for you were you, God, you formed my inward parts and you knitted together, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am wondrously made. Wonderful are your works. Now, again, your parents didn't create you or make you. God created you. Male and female, he created them. And as men and women, we are called to be participants in the creative work of God, in procreation. There's a reason you're a woman, there's a reason you're a man, male and female. Now, I know the world is going through this whole thing about um, being transsexual or identifying as a woman even though you're a man. Uh, there's, you can't do that in an understanding of who God is. And be you can't be a traditional Christian or a biblical Christian or an Orthodox Christian. It says, God made you male and female. Now, you might be struggling with that, and you might need counseling about that or healing about that, but you are male and female. You're made the way you are, and you're made, men are made different than women. And at the very core of that was you were made so you could participate in the creative work of God. Um, and if God created you, that's good. God created good. He didn't create, uh, there's a bumper sticker that was very popular in the early charismatic movement that said, God doesn't make junk. And he doesn't, he didn't. God makes that which is lovable and is called to be in relationship with him. And, um, it's good. Now, there are certainly things that happen in the genetic process of development from conception. Um, there's the, the process of the tragedy of a, a miscarriage. And I know many women who've had miscarriage, there's a, there's a suffering involved in that. Why? Because they lost a life. There was a, there was a child. They were participating. They'd begun... The minute they heard that the child was being formed, they fell in love with that baby. And uh, when they lost the baby, um, there's oftentimes this suffering that causes depression and anxiety. And for many Christians wondering, where is God? It's, it's, it's a loss. Um, and, but something genetically happened. God didn't kill that baby. God didn't take that baby. There's a, as a result of our fallen nature, there's an impact on that creative process. Physical handicaps, uh, people born with certain diseases. Um, you know, my, my eyes tear up when I watch uh, television commercials. Here we get them in America from St. Jude's Hospital, Children's Hospital, the Shriners Hospital, of these children who are uh, have birth defects. And yet you see these wonderful people, incredibly, I, I don't think there's anybody greater on the face of the earth than people who work with, with um, critical risk pregnancies and, and uh, uh, pre, you know, preemies, babies born too soon, high risk babies, or with those who have handicaps. They're the, they're the salt of the earth. Um, what a blessing. 
Um, so there's Down syndrome, and uh, which is not, by the way, a birth defect. It's an extra chromosome. And uh, I don't know how, again, if you've been with somebody who uh, uh, has Down syndrome or with, uh, uh, with somebody who has a Down syndrome child, I know several that... Uh, they're a joy that whatever that if it's a disability I want it on some levels there's this uh, beauty in that that extra chromosome brings um, but we're never called to solve the problem by ending by murder uh, death is never the answer to to a problem it's never a solution to any problem God is a God of life because God is a God of love and every person created in the womb is created by God and God will take whatever the suffering is, and he'll use it for his redemptive purposes. Now, the church has always affirmed the dignity of all human life, and especially the dignity of women. The model of the Blessed Mother and her holding the infant child, Jesus, uh, has always been a part uh, of Christian teaching and art from the earliest days of the church. In fact, on my wall, you can't see it. It's above Kathy's head, who's photographing. It's a, it's a Celtic uh, Madonna and child. And uh, way back in that, that period of time, I don't know if I have one behind me, but the, the, here's Mary, a mother, a mother and a child, uh, a, a humanity holding humanity. That here's Jesus, who certainly gets his divinity from his father, but he gets his humanity from his mother. And Mary's therefore called the Theotokos, the mother of God. Not the creator of God, by the way, but the mother of God, because Jesus is God. And it's an image I love, because it's an image of life. It's an image of love. There's, I think there's nothing greater than a, than a mother's love towards a child. And, um, you know, it, there was a study once... Um, and I forget who did it, but that they that it did one of the difference between men and women. They give say, they ask if you were in uh, a boat and the boat began to sink, and you, your spouse, and your children were all drowning. Who would you save first? And the women, the mothers, universally said, "I'd save my children." The fathers universally said, "I'd save my wife." And uh, so there's this connection that the, the mother has with her children. The father's idea, I guess, is, well, I can always make more children. Um, but not for the mother. Every life, every one of her children is sacred. And, and men feel that way, too. Men honor that. I don't want to sound cold. There's obviously other uh, factors involved. And so God is the God of life. He didn't come to create death. He didn't create death. The wages of sin is death and disease and destruction, uh, but the free gift of God is life, eternal life. So Jesus came to bring that life. I have come, he said, to bring life um, and eternal life. And how we have been created will determine on many levels the good work that we've been created to walk in. For example, as we've been talking I am not called to walk as a mother. Now, I can do mothering if my, if, um, of course, my children are all raised, and, but if, uh, Lord have mercy, Kathy had died and I was a single father and I had three kids, I would have to do some mother things and learn that role. We see, it, we see in our culture today, unfortunately, in the American culture, single mothers who are soon to outnumber uh, mothers with husbands. And they're, they're in a tremendous, um, tremendous struggle. Um, but on the whole, women are going to be mothers. They're going to give birth, at least. And that's the reason I get upset when people talk, you know, they'll come, a man and a woman, they'll come and say, oh, we're pregnant. Um, as if that husband or biological father, i let you know, you're not pregnant. She's pregnant. Uh, and you made her pregnant. Now, you're part of the... Thank God you're a couple, and I hope you bear responsibility and you and you act like a father and a dad. Um, but you, you're not pregnant. That's that's, um, and you're never going to be a mother. I can, however, for I can be a father, and I did. Uh, and I believe each father should be a dad. There's a difference. Um, but when and so when you embrace 
through the reproductive act of procreation, uh, either role of mother or father, which is a good work for which you were biologically created, you are now called into the good work of parenting, being a dad and a mom, and you need to walk in that. What a blessing with adoptive parents who take a child out of foster care or have been abandoned, and you get the good work of being a mom and a dad as well. Um, now, so that, and I'm not going to touch the issue of same-sex um, adoptions, but you know, praise God that it's not the child, and uh, hopefully the child has and grows up uh, healthy and loved. And single parents, for whatever reason, especially women, have a, have there's a lack of as of a spouse or a father, and we know it has consequences. We need only look at the consequences of fatherlessness in the American culture and the European culture. Uh, men who are not walking and doing the good work God has prepared for them and have abandoned their children. And so it's really simple. What are the consequences? The majority of the poor in America are, are single mothers with children. That's poor in America. Fatherless children have a greater chance of living in poverty. They're more likely to get involved in drugs and alcohol abuse, drop out of school, suffer from health and emotional problems. And girls, young girls who don't have fathers raising them are more likely to become involved in crime and pregnancy and suffer from severe uh, uh, depression. Now, and this is, I believe, the failure of a father uh, walking in the good work he was created to walk in and instead choosing to walk in his own selfish desires. I have a dear friend um, who suffered very early on and, and genetically with cerebral palsy. And as a result, he had great difficulty with motor movements and speech, particularly walking. Um, and one day uh, I asked him how he dealt with it growing up, that with the limitations and the disability. After explaining that he was thankful for all the things that this country had done to make uh, things more accessible to him. He said dealing with his limi limitations was not that hard. And I looked kind of at him. He said that very early on, he had to embrace the limitations and work with what he had to advance himself. Then he looked at me and said, I just know, he said, I would never run in the Olympics. And then he smiled and looked at me and said, but Father, you won't either. I couldn't stop laughing. See, life was sacred, and he, he had a great life. Still does. He's still alive and, uh, um, and was accepted and fit in. He was so right. All of us... <laughs> Uh, I have those limitations. I was and am the least athletic person I know. I could just about just about run the, around the track when I was in high school. I failed at every sport I ever tried. I was not made to be a ballet dancer or a gymnast or a mathematician, by the way. Uh, hence, engineering was out and science was out. I could barely balance a checkbook, so I had to rule out banking. Some of the things I could not do, um, I believe is just because of how I was created and because of the environment I grew up in. Um, I don't know how to use tools. Um, my father never taught me. He hired things out to get done. Or uh, what's under the engine? He just taught me how to go to the mechanic. And so I'm still challenged with that. But I did learn to walk in what my own creation. I love to read, to talk, and to express my opinion about everything. And I still am amazed that I get paid to do it. I get amazed that you listen to this. I get amazed for the last 40 years that people would show up Sunday after Sunday to hear me preach and, and present the Word of God. Uh, it was not without work. I had to work at it and study, and I had effort, and I, and uh, but I flowed in it, because, and I found great joy in it because it was how I was created. And I rejoice in how each of us are wonderfully made, and yet we're so diverse. 
There's lots of ways, by the way, to determine what you are able to do and what you are able not to do. Some of them you can rule out on your own. But there are organizations and groups and tests and skills and um, that can help you find that if that's what you're interested in. And then you'd be walking in the good work that God has prepared for you to walk in. I'm sure Paul is writing a little bit about this, but I think in context he's talking about things that we all were created to do, the good works. Remember I said the passage is we, not me. So we were created for relationships. We were created to be in relationship with God and hence in relationship with each other. We were created to receive love and to give love. And I know a lot of people who have a hard time receiving God's love, and hence they have a hard time giving God's love. And as a church, we need to help people do that, to receive. And I pray more and more pastors preach the, cru- preach the crucifixion and what it's like to receive the love of God. We were created to receive forgiveness and to give forgiveness. We were created to receive mercy and to give mercy. We were created to care for one another and to care for the least among us. We're created to worship God. We're created to create. We're created to choose good and not evil. We're called to mirror God, to be holy because he's holy. I think this is what, in essence, what Paul is pointing out. We are not saved by good works, but we're created for the good works. The issue, again, worked out by James, who stresses the importance of faith and works together, and we can get to that down the road. It is actually our surrendering to the grace of God that we bear the fruit of being in union with Christ. And we do that through prayer, through reading of Scripture, through works of charity, servanthood, and above all, the Holy Eucharist, eating his flesh and drinking his blood that releases the good works that God has created in us and for us. Back to the will of God, and let me conclude with this. I know I'm going a little long. Jesus talked about blaspheming the Holy Spirit and not being forgiven. And I've had so many Christians through my ministry wonder if they've committed this horrendous sin. The answer I give is, if you are worried that you have committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, then you haven't. Uh, Because it's the Holy Spirit that convicts you of sin. In the same way, I think, with the purposes and plan of God. The fact that a person wants to be in the will of God and in his ways and in his purposes suggests that they are in his will and in his ways and in his purposes. I've been in ministry for over four decades, and I am now in a new place. And, and am I in God's will, ways, and purpose? I know I am, because I want to be. And I know that I don't want everything, I don't know everything that's there and what it's all about in this new spot, this new place. But I believe God honors the fact that we desire to love him with all that we are and all that we have. And he loves us and he responds to that love. Even if we're a little bit in rebellion, a father still loves the rebellious son. Read the story of the prodigal son. It's that desire longing to shower his rebellious son with his love and blessings. Don't worry. Don't worry about success. Worry about faithfulness. Mother Teresa said, God is not interested in our being successful. He's concerned about our being faithful. And even if we're not faithful, God is faithful, especially to forgive our sins. He will not leave us or forsake us. We're going to pick up on this a little bit as we go into uh, the end of chapter 2. And Father, just uh, continue. Everyone who's seeking you and seeking your will, uh, we desire to know that. They desire to know that. They've listened to this little reflection. Uh, Grant them wisdom and knowledge. Speak to them, Lord, through prayer, through scripture, through a friend, uh, through their own self-examination, and so that they can find peace in your plan. And and God, blessing of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forever. Amen.